No issue stirred more passion in the 2016 elections than border security and immigration. Now a new documentary looks beyond the heated rhetoric to look closer at the reason why people and drugs keep pouring across our border. Lawmakers make new progress on a budget compromise, but it comes with big cuts that could hit poor and disabled people in Texas. Good morning and thank you for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. Texas lawmakers are gearing up for a battle over the state budget. The House Appropriations Committee passed their version this week and it comes with big cuts that have some people concerned. The House proposal calls for $218 billion in spending, down $3 billion from the first draft. Medicaid takes the biggest hit. House budget writers cut $1 billion for Medicaid, and that's not all. If the cuts go through, the state will also lose $1.4 billion in federal funding. The plan will go to the full House for a vote, likely later this week. Austin Democrat Donna Howard is on the Appropriations Committee that approved the budget. Our Robert Hadlock spoke with Representative Howard to get her perspective on the proposal. Representative Donna Howard, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Well, this week, uh, of course, the Appropriations Committee passed uh, the budget plan that would uh, cut $2 billion from Medicaid. Of course, you're a nurse. Why cut Medicaid? Well, I think we need to explain that just a little bit. Um, some of the things that we do at the legislature to help us balance our budget, which we're required to do by the Constitution, is we uh, look at some accounting maneuvers, if you will, one of which is and this happens on a regular basis for probably every budget since I've been here, uh, underfunding, if you will, by not fully paying for the growth of Medicaid or fully paying for the cost increases. That is about a billion of GR, general revenue. The rest of what you're talking about are the federal funds that come with it. So in essence, we are underfunding by about a billion dollars with the intention of making it up like we do every session when we come back in January with a supplemental bill. Are there any safeguards in place to protect patients to make sure they're getting the care they need? They need? Well, that would certainly be a concern of mine and I think in, in, in most people. And uh, yes, indeed, we, we've never had a situation where this has resulted in decreased services. Um, and we've been assured by the chairman, Chairman Zerwas, that that won't occur this time as well. However, we are drafting some language to clarify uh, the meaning of this rider uh, in the budget so that we can assure people that this will not result in decreased eligibility or rate reductions. Of course, uh, funding for Child Protective Services is a huge issue because of the ongoing problems with that agency. They say they need more money to yes. uh, correct some of the problems that we all know about. What's your take on that? I feel like we shortchanged that a bit. Uh, we have limited resources available to us this time because of, quite frankly, manufactured uh, shortfalls that we have because of decisions made last session. That being said, I think everybody's concerned, it's bipartisan concern about children dying under our watch. And uh, we, the agency asked for about a billion dollars to plug a lot of the holes that would allow them to hopefully keep children safe. Uh, we didn't get to that point. Um, I think some of us are gonna be pushing that we do fully fund what the request was because um, Quite frankly, this is a high priority for all of us, and we want to keep our children safe. The House budget uh, adds $1.5 billion for public schools. Uh, that money is not in the Senate plan. Uh, how would that funding make it to the final budget? Mm -hmm. Well, these magical things happen in conference <laughs> committees at the end of session, where five senators and five reps get together behind closed doors and, and duke it out, so to speak. Um, but I know that the House is going to be very, very forceful in making sure that we have this one and a half billion dollars additional in the budget. Um, we're going to be voting on a bill later on this session that will provide how this money would be divvied up among the districts. And uh, the 1.5 is contingent upon that bill passing. We've heard a lot in the news coverage uh, over the last couple of months about school choice, uh, bathroom mm -hmm. bill. Uh, some would say those are wedge issues. Right. Uh, what are your consist constituents asking you and telling you about uh, what's going on at the Capitol? Are those big concerns to them? Uh, no. <laughs> the choices of concern in terms of what I hear from my constituents here in the Austin area, they want to see public dollars stay in public schools and want to make sure that we increase the choice we have within our public school system, uh, but also uh, increase the basic funding. One of the biggest 
issues people have is the unaccountability that occurs when you send public dollars to private schools, but also the fact that we have not adequately funded our public schools to begin with to take money away from schools that are inadequately funded in the first place is, is really just uh, and totally off the table for most of my constituents. Well, what would you say to those who say, that's our tax money we're putting into this building here behind us. Uh, we should be able to spend it uh, how we see fit for our children. Well, you know, certainly uh, I know that people don't believe that, some people don't believe the public schools have the options for them and uh, they do look at other options. Uh, we need to do a better job of making sure we address the needs of all children because public schools are required to teach every child that walks through their doors. Um, I understand that uh, people want the dollars to follow the children, but that's part of what representative government is all about. You know, you could choose where all your tax dollars go. I could choose, they might all be different places. We would have a chaotic government if we did it that way. We have to make some kind of, of decisions that benefit the common good, and uh, that's what we do with public education. State Representative Donna Howard of Austin, thanks for coming in. We Thank appreciate you. hearing your views. Thank you. Josh, back to you. Thank you, Robert. One big difference between the House and Senate budget plans is the House plan uses money from the state's rainy day fund. The House budget would spend $2.5 billion from the fund. That's more than a quarter of its balance. The money would cover a shortfall in the teacher pension program and pay for improvements at state mental health hospitals. The House would also use the rainy day fund to cover an increase in border security costs. The Senate plan does not tap the rainy day fund at all, but critics say Senate budget writers are are relying on accounting tricks to get the funds they need. Plans to build a wall along the border fuels angry debate, but does that debate miss the point? How a new report is looking beyond the heated rhetoric to find the reasons why people and drugs keep pouring across the Texas border. It's a rogue agency that is, uh, deals and scares the heck out of the people. People are scared to death of the IRS. A congressman who represents part of Austin sets his sights on the IRS, why he says the agency that collects your taxes needs major cutbacks. This is the time of the year when a lot of folks think about and complain about their taxes, but the agency that collects your taxes is also taking a hit. President Trump's budget cuts nearly $240 million from the Internal Revenue Service. Now a congressman who represents part of Austin says that's not enough. Republican Roger Williams wants to gut the agency. Here's what he said on CNBC earlier this week. Would you be in favor of uh, more funding for the IRS or less? Well, no, I'm one of those that love to do away with the IRS. It's a, it's a rogue agency that is, uh, deals and scares the heck out of the people. People are scared to death of the IRS. So that's that whole thing, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Uh, the fact of the matter is the IRS, along with some other agencies, uh, should be uh, downsized and basically made a collection agency. Uh, but, there, but there's typically something like $450 billion in terms of a gap that, that, that people don't, that, that's not captured by the government, even though... Uh, we should be getting that. What do you do about that part of it? Well, I mean, look, at, we need to capture what's needed, but we don't need to capture what's not needed. The IRS does a pretty good job of going after uh, people that really have done nothing wrong and, uh, and, and so forth. So they need to have the rules rewritten. They need to be smaller. They need to be a, 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 an agency that people don't fear and one that be just like I said, be a collection agency and collect what we're due and not what we're not due. Okay, we need to explain why they started playing music in that clip. That part of the interview happened as the CNBC show was running out of time, so the show's producer used the music to get Williams to wrap things up faster. It's kind of like what they do at the speeches at the Oscars. As for Representative Williams' position on the IRS, there's some history. Williams said after his father died, the IRS hit him with high inheritance taxes on the car dealership he inherited. Williams worked out a plan to save the business, but said he spent 20 years paying off the government. The IRS is already shrinking, and the biggest reason has little to do with politics. Right now, close to 84,000 people work for the IRS. But the agency plans to cut more than 7,000 workers over the next seven years. All the cuts are supposed to save the IRS more than $266 million. 
The job cuts will hit hard in Austin. Right now, around 5,200 people in the Austin area work for the IRS. By 2024, the IRS plans to eliminate 2,400 of those jobs. Most of the folks losing jobs are the workers who process paper tax returns. There's just less of a demand for them. For perspective, in 2006, just over half of all taxpayers filed their returns electronically. Now, almost everyone does it. Last year, the number rose to 91 percent. If we have a drug problem in this country, it's not because we have too many drugs, it's because we have too many people who want to take drugs. A new documentary looks closer at the reasons why people and drugs keep pouring into Texas, how the answers go well beyond the border. Border security and the border wall continue to fuel heated rhetoric in Texas and around the country. This week, our partners at the Texas Tribune revealed a project called Beyond the Wall. It's a documentary that takes a closer look at the reasons behind the flow of people who cross the border illegally. One part of the documentary looked at children who make the dangerous journey. It's easy to fear the border, but then you run across all these kids. Kids traveling alone, kids fleeing lives of desperation, kids who are coming here to join their undocumented parents. That's where the big numbers are down here. It's the kids in the family units, as they're called. And they don't run, they turn themselves in. They cross them, yeah. and then they tell them, okay, just follow the road all the way to the top. So here comes the family unit, just walk in the road. It's mainly gangs that they're fleeing from. So I get why they're leaving. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we still have a job to do, you know, and all of them can apply for asylum. It'll be up to, to the immigration judge to decide, you know, their fate. We met a 14-year-old Guatemalan girl who was headed to Houston. She traveled here with her brother and cousin. They were forced to cross the river alone when their smuggler abandoned them on the Mexican side. Beyond the Wall is part of an in-depth series of reports from the Texas Tribune. Joining us now is Jay Root, the reporter on this documentary. How did this project even come about? Well, so we started, uh, it really started kind of in Trump Tower when Donald Trump announced for president. Um, and my editor said, you know, she was looking for good investigative ideas for uh, project-worthy stuff. And I said, let's do border, you know, kind of in this age of Trump as a candidate. And lo and behold, he became president. So, you know, the timing was sort of good. Um, but, you know, we spent this, we spent 18 months on this project called Bordering on Insecurity. And every step of the way, we were taking video and audio and photos and all of that. We, I think we used like 10 or 12 different kinds of cameras, GoPros, I mean, all kinds of different equipment. Um, and it, you know, it came together sort of at the end of that project. No, it was great. And you had the premiere this past week. You know, what are people saying about it? I wondered what lawmakers received it like. Um, I've gotten a lot of really positive feedback. Um, and, and, you know, I think what's unusual about it is some of the stuff that we have, uh, like from Central America, for example, and the realization that I, people have told me, it's the realization that this is just happening in our hemisphere. You know, we, it's almost like we know more about what's going on in the Middle East than we do in our own backyard. You know, a trip to California, you could go all the way down to where these people are coming from, but nobody really knows what's going on down there. The little girl that we saw in the clip, I mean, that was a heartbreaking story, I thought. I mean, what do you think from a journalist standpoint when you actually get that kind of access and get to meet those kind of people? Well, I, I honestly was fighting back tears when I talked to her. Um, I, was, I was pretty emotional, and I, I was kind of like, I'm, I'm usually not emotional. I mean, I've been doing this for, you know, a couple of decades. But um, I was also found it somewhat uplifting, you know, because... She said she wanted to be a doctor and she really wanted to go to school. She hadn't seen her mother in years. She only knew her mother from pictures because her mother had left before, you know, when she was like, I don't know, three or four years old. And she talked to her mother a lot on the phone. But, you know, just imagining this girl that had done this incredible journey. And I mean, it, I was blown away that she talked about how the smuggler had left them and, you know, pushed her off in this raft because the smugglers, 
uh, don't want to get caught, obviously. And so, you know, they, they take this whole trip, they get to the river, they're like, okay, you're on your own. My, you know, three little kids and one of her cousins that was in the boat with her, I think was like eight or nine years old. And, you know, they could have fallen in and drowned. I mean, it just, just to imagine the gravity of that in, in front of you is pretty amazing. Uh, I know a portion of the documentary you use KXAN's work from our Border Splurge series. Um, you know, when you talk about the kind of things that we were focusing on, you know, state funding and, and all of the presence down there of DPS troopers, I mean, is that kind of what you saw where you were at as well? Well, first of all, thank you very much for letting us use that because that actually, uh, we got to a point where we, we had a gap. And one of the problems was is that even though we spent 18, 18 months on bordering on insecurity, believe it or not, I mean, we went to Central America, obviously spent a lot of time on the border. Um, we went into workplaces and all that. But one thing we didn't really do was an in-depth look at the border spending. And so y'all's report came out at right the per, at the perfect time. We put it up on our website. I thought it was very thorough. And we needed that to, because the, the last part of, of the movie, of the, of the documentary, um, really brings this all back to us and to Texas and what are we doing um, and if you look at what we're doing we're spending all this money but I mean is it really stopping people is it stopping drugs as you pointed out in your reporting the price of dope if anything has gone down mm -hmm. so that was very very crucial well um, when you look for the future what's next with this project you're doing right now I, I've You're not of, done, are you? It's, well, it's I, you know, I, I would <laughs> like to do a director's cut, honestly. I, I haven't really gotten the okay to do that. But we have a lot of, like, for example, we ran into this immigrant um, who tried, who was going to cross, and he didn't, and I want to follow up on that. We have a lot of footage we didn't use. We, you know, we have a lot of material left over, and so I would like to do that. But also, you know, with this discussion of a border wall, um, I think there can be, you know, more to be done on that for sure. So hopefully there will be more. Well, certainly they're going to be talking about it um, in Washington and here in Austin. Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, they're still spending quite a lot of money. Um, and as we pointed out in our report, and thanks to your reporting, is that we're focusing on the supply. You know, we're focusing all this attention on trying to stop people from coming across. But then once they get here, they're finding jobs, and we're not penalizing the employers. So, you know, we're not really putting our money where our mouth is there. And then on drug treatment, we're, we're really shortchanging all the drug treatment. And if you talk to lawmakers, they'll say, we need to spend more money on that to reduce the demand. Uh, you know, the demand for illegal labor, the demand for illegal drugs is extremely high. And if we don't do anything about that, you can spend all the money you want on the border, but you're not gonna stop it. Jay, very great, compelling work. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. And you can check out the Beyond the Wall program. We have a link on our website and this story, you can also see the link for our Border Splurge project as well. Thanks, appreciate it. All right, thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. Stay tuned for an update on your weather, then meet the press at nine. I'm Josh Hinkle, have a great day.